My name is Tom. I'm your poet leader for today. <laughs> this is our book, Paradise Found. I know some of you saw it and heard about it in the newspaper. And we're going to do a little walk around Northampton following the map and the poetry in the book. And it's going to be fun. And, you know, if the sun comes out, it's going to be really nice, but it's poetic. This kind of weather, even if it storms, it's poetic. So it'll be great. So, um, the first thing I think we'll do is our first poet will be Kathleen, and we'll read it. We'll go right into the greenhouse and go into the jungle room and read it. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right. that I read a little excerpt from uh, Sylvia Plath's journal here. I think that would be appropriate. Since she was a Smith College student and that's where a lot of her, uh, I think a lot of her muse for her poetry comes from her time in, there, in Northampton and at Smith College and living here and teaching here afterwards. From Sylvia Plath's journals, January 1953, Monday morning, January, dry, hard, glaring, cold, and the wicked, naked beauty of scraped blue skies, and the sun sparks ricocheting jazzily off car rooftops. Last night it was cold. Suddenly the loud, big wind rip-roaring down from some no-man's land of snow. So that's what we got to look forward to. <laughs> Enjoy the fall. Not the winter. Well, you can enjoy the winter too, but it'll be cold. So. All right, let's keep on going. So my poetry quiz for today. <laughs> Who uh, did the statue? Let her down. If I had candy bars, I'd <laughs> Leonard Baskin, famous sculptor and friend of Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes. And um, furnished the cover for Crow by Ted Hughes. Yeah. Pretty cool. With his sculpture Crow. Pretty cool. That yeah. cover. Yep, that's right. And um, you can see more of his work when we go down to the Michelson Gallery afterwards. And I had, a, I had the pleasure of meeting him a few times. And uh, they lived up on Autobahn Road in Leeds. And he had a big studio there. And had an amazing amount of sculpture and art. And uh, so while I'm here, I will read uh, Kicking the Leaves by William Doreski. Kicking the Leaves in Northampton big orangey rubbery maple leaves, I feel like Sylvia Plath. Feel beautiful as Sylvia Plath. The fruit in the State Street fruit store, pears, bananas, kiwi, tangerines, weeping with joy as I pass. But I'm nothing like Sylvia Plath, who's walking a block ahead of me, 
her Breck girl blonde rug flopping in the breeze, her blue jeans bursting. No, she's not Sylvia Plath, but she totes Marlowe's Dr. Faustus as if she means it. Maybe she does. On Green Street, I stop for latte. Guzzle the hot, expensive brew as if draining half the Atlantic to expose the fossils lurking on the seafloor where cargo ships rust from the Second World War in a mess of spilled munitions. Sylvia and Ted lie together, their bones polished by the royal of deep, deep currents, their love or lust still legendary, their fatal quarrel still writhing, their faces effaced, but their writing permanent as frost-killed ferns. Back outside, latte swilling through me, I kick the leaves and scatter them like the dead poets. Marvel, Platt, Keats, Hughes, Elliot, Stevens. We learn to admire regardless of how little we resemble them in moments when we're most alone. by Ellen Dory Watson, and I think she's the head of the Poetry Center here. And that's the Poetry Center she's over by the Baskin Owl. Right there. Where the owl is. That way. Yeah, behind the owl. Great place for stuff. Dogged hearts. Hobbled by crab apples underfoot, my body and I flop into the car, not all together together, and struggle to find post-yoga live. The back road offers a crone. I can only use the word beholding the dead deer at her feet. Then a woman in a wheelchair whooshing like a breeze down a blue ramp, chugging towards school, a, a rail of a boy whose gait says, any smaller and I disappear. Fingerprints in motion, fleeting disclosure. In town, a girl in the crosswalk, like her hips are a gift. A mangy man outside the bank cradles a guitar as if he just landed a whopping fish. How inhabit this flesh we didn't choose? Love something. And um, I think the intersection is the intersection by the Academy of Music. Yes. That she's okay. And I think we'll proceed now to Pulaski Park. That sounds good. And read a couple poems, because we should be able to have a good okay. gathering and a, good, a little bit of more quiet there than the, right at the intersection, okay? okay? So we'll take a little yeah. stroll to Pulaski Park. Thank you.
across like my kids were gifted. Yeah. yeah. Being on the steps of the Academy of Music, uh, which was once, uh, once one of the performers here who gave Northampton the name, the paradise of America, was the uh, Swedish Nightingale, Jenny Lynn. And so uh, my friend and poet, Nancy Denning, wrote a poem called Jenny's Handkerchief, and I'll read that right here. <laughs> Jenny's Handkerchief. Imagine a low-slung row of shops that drew her into brows and buy a hat, I hear. Her hotel, the Draper, which is down the street, crowd across the street, a courthouse, yes, but smaller, and the most elegant itineration, iteration, some say of our meeting house in clapboard, gleaming white, a felicitous New England town, Imagine a carriage drawing up to City Hall's castellated portal, new at the time, and just, shall we say, as singular. The City Hall's right down the street. Through. Jenny and her hosts are on their way to admire this Arcadian Valley, as so many notables have before. Their horse trots past the leafy green, and occasional well-kept homes along Main Street there in the distance, the distinctive silhouette of our small anomalous mountain range as it was and almost ever shall be. Look, Miss Lynn, Mount Hoyo. Can you see the mountain house upon it? Their carriage plows through Hockenham Meadows, rustling louder than the singer's silks. Locusts drill and larks delight the nightingale. More adventuresome now aboard the ferry than ever upwards switchbacks to the summit. This is her place. From here laid out before her the picturesque ideal. Yet to the real from whence she's come, the grand and seeming tame Connecticut at its celebrated oxbow and farmer's fields within the river's springtime reach. See over there, Miss Lynn, that spire and housetops nesting in the trees? Northampton. There, as everywhere, its citizens swooned to the Swedish nightingale singing. But more, it's where and nowhere else she dropped a shining epithet, a scented handkerchief. In her wake, this place is paradise. Nancy Denny. Oh. Paradise. <laughs> Yes, um, this fellow worked at the concession stand for I don't know how many years, and then they made, and then um, Randy Deal did his portrait and it hung it. I think it's probably still hanging in there. Where is it? New York. It's in New York now in in the Metropolitan. Awesome. But for years it was here, and the guy was still working here when it was here, and it was really cool. But he was a little, a little fellow, but he ran a concession stand and stuff. And there that's it is. Pretty cool. Yeah. Do you want to do this, Howie? Because if I don't sing it, I'm not going to do it. Okay, I'll do it. Borbo's Town. It all comes down to one big street and one big man with arms flung wide as the world it rides on. This odd little city with its hills and plains its misfits, heretics, and one big man on the weather-beaten street of a paradise of exiles, asylum for the sane, and every inch of him a fixture, a signpost for the mind, that smile of his, a signature, his arms embracing brotherly the rain.
We'll go down Masonic Street first, and we'll go up by the Iron Horse and come up that way. How's that sound? Okay? Okay. You're the leader. I'm talking about David. David. I have the traffic now. <laughs> no, we are we are our parking is almost out, so we have to go. So one of our one of our uh, people here, her mother helps restore this. There it is, right there, Joanne Dwyer. Isn't that great? In uh, 2003. So uh, it's a history of women in North Hampton. It's a beautiful girl. It's one of my favorite. It's, it's great. Absolutely. It was, I love it. These are the kind of things that make North Hampton an interesting town. This kind of stuff. And this kind of stuff. This one makes it cool. So we've got Bellows right there. Yeah, we're going to walk down to Bellows. And <laughs> Dining at Bellas. <laughs> Thickly butter my bread and make velvet soup like Lily does. She knows life is in the gravy. Each flavor rich spoonful and extension of her fingers. Tailored food making moments matter more. A Masonic street cook creating a difference. Lasting longer than the meal. A plentiful plate, presuming room for joy. <laughs> By Mel Mary Delabriere. De Delabriere, thank you. Mary Delabriere, who's also another local poet that I've met. That's very good. And this, of course, is Bella's Restaurant. And right there, I was telling uh, some of the people that this is where I worked. This is the old fire station, built in 1872. I spent the first 15 years of my career there. And uh, it was great. I loved it. I wish I was back there again. <laughs> we had the, uh, the cistern in the floor where you used to pull the bucket up. We didn't have horses, but they had the, where you'd water the horses. And in, the, in the back, in the shop in the back, they had the forge where they'd make the horseshoes and stuff. It was awesome. There's a poem in there somewhere. There is a poem there somewhere. <laughs> I'll get to it. So one of these days. Well, you could retire. <laughs> You'll be back there. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, move up the street. We'll go up by the Iron Horse there. We'll come back out on Main Street. There you go. Just take it over. I pulled into Haydenville in a VW camper. I camped in a friend's driveway. He had told me to come out from Buffalo, New York, that this is where it was happening <laughs> for artists. He had a studio in Florence, Mass. This is when the Iron Horse was only one little storefront. It was only half of this. If you lived here, you know this. And there's actually a book from Levelers at a TV show, a documentary, um, 
I didn't think what it's called. Memories of the Iron Horse. Something like that. Positively, Positively Center Street. Yeah, that's Positively right. Center. Thank you. Take off a Bob Dylan's Positively Horse. <laughs> they had on the wall. May the arts live. They also have in their music alone shelter. That's their famous thing. Later musicians would complain. How are the artists supposed to live? I was performing, juggling in the streets. One day I was informed the International Juggling Festival was happening at Hampshire College. I walked into a room of people throwing things in the air and at each other. <laughs> I became a professional juggler. <laughs> Making my living for more than 20 years, I would be part of many a first night. And twice at the really big show at the Academy of Music. Where on the stage, one could feel and smell in the curtains all the great acts that had been there. There were many jugglers in the area who would meet in Pulaski Park. When the state closed down the mental institution, the audience became more interesting. <laughs> and the streets seemed sadder. With many wandering around with nowhere to go, there were still many affordable studio spaces. This would soon change as the city became the hip place to be, as Smith College no longer worried about being the lesbian mecca. New restaurants opened and closed. New restaurants opened and closed and opened. <laughs> New businesses came and went, and the rents kept climbing. Before they did, there was theater in the streets, in abandoned storefronts. Creativity poured into the streets from alleyways. A vanguard movie house opened, coffee houses, dancing the night away at dance spree. There were hovels known as bars that gave some of the greatest bands in the area a crowded, sweaty religious experience. That soon would be cleaned up, made into hip clubs that lost the edge. Now it would take someone a few weeks to eat in all the restaurants, probably a, probably a few months. <laughs> and a small fortune. And a small fortune. Hip shops continue to open. Continue to open as prices go up. The wandering lost people seem to have wandered somewhere else. East End. Yes, probably. <laughs> there are yeah, oh yeah. There are still the street musicians here and there, and those that ask for spare change, we'll see them later. And the venues known for known artists have increased. Known artists, where there are a number of shows to be seen on any given night. Yet the up and coming artists have moved out getting pushed from one down and out city to another. As the hipness follows and the prices go up, they search for other abandoned buildings, low rent districts, factories that have been turned into malls. The sign reads- Go around, sweetie, go around. It's okay. Let the artists live. What about the artists? By Paul Richmond. All right. All right. I like this venue, it's got echo. <laughs> Thank you. Designer clothes, maybe Armani. 
He keeps looking at his solid gold wristwatch. Maybe Patek Philippe. Nobody pays him any attention. He is just another stray billionaire from Wall Street. <laughs> or a Hollywood fancy pants waiting for a camera crew or a local denizen. Down from Hospital Hill, practicing for Halloween, Satan paces back and forth, starting to fume. He stamps his custom-made cloven hoof boots. A shower of red and gold sparks flies up. He is muttering terrible swear words under his brimstone breath. Fiendish incantations. He glares at the Cornell turrets at City Hall. Then out at the Main Street traffic, down towards Thorns Market. And last, he looks up the street to the gates of Smith College. Aha, he sees a crowd in front of the Academy of Music. Demons are massing in front of the theater like shiny black beetles. <laughs> Satan strides up the street, trailing a little cloud of sparks and ashes. His cloak follows behind him, be past the Lieutenant Unitarian Church, Memorial Hall, Pulaski Park. Pedestrians give him a wide berth. They cross over to the Broadside Bookshop on the other side of the street. He stalks into the theater, not pausing to admire the photograph of Judy Garland. <laughs> or the one of Peter O'Toole, photographed to Duane, who managed the Academy for years. Satan doesn't notice the fan famous Randy Deal painting that hangs over the candy counter. We've seen that. Or the inverted bathtub ceiling and branching brass chandelier of the inner lobby. He sweeps down the aisle past Lautrec posters of Jane Avril and Aristide Briant. The theater is jam-packed with demons. They fill the loges and spill over the balcony. A black gown chorus fills the stage. An orchestra of mostly shiny, bright brasses, golden horns, and some very fine Stradivarius violins are tuning up. Satan stamps up to the conductor's podium in center stage, flings black his cloak, the red-hot satin lining still smoking a little from hell, raises his shining baton like a wand, an earthly hush falls over the theater. The baton descends, and in Paradise City, the music begins, heavenly music, to make the angels weep, as you can imagine. There might be an unintended moral to this story, or perhaps not. <laughs> Catherine Hazen, City Hall Main Street. Okay, let's uh, cross the street. Dyke's Pantoum. <laughs> Would you look at those girls standing on the street acting as if they own it, laughing in twos and threes, 
standing on the street in their jean jackets and fry boots, laughing in twos and threes, cuffing each other on the shoulder, in their jean jackets and fry boots, not saying excuse me, cuffing each other on the shoulder when some guy bumps into them, not saying excuse me, but watch where you're going, buddy, when some guy bumps into them with their short, sharp hair. But watch where you're going, buddy. Some of them have tattoos with their short, sharp hair and axes around their necks. Some of them have tattoos. My mother wouldn't like that. And axes around their necks. They don't even wear brassiers. My mother wouldn't like that. Who do they think they are anyway? They don't even wear brassiers or eyeliner or lipstick or nothing. Who do they think they are anyway? How come they don't carry pocketbooks or eyeliner or lipstick or nothing? One of them's got purple streaks in her hair. How come they don't carry pocketbooks? Two of them have motorcycle helmets. One of them's got purple streaks in her hair, and I think she's winking at me. <laughs> Two of them have motorcycle helmets. The blonde one's name is Rattlesnake, and I think she's winking at me. <laughs> You think I could learn to stand like that? The blonde, oh, yeah, there. The blonde one's name is Rattlesnake. Her leather pants look like they've been spray painted on. You think I could learn to stand like that? I'd sure like to give it a try. <laughs> Her leather pants look like they've been spray painted on. I wonder how she gets them up. I'd sure like to give it a try. Uh-oh, looks like they're getting ready to move. I wonder how she gets them up over her gorgeous hips and ass and thighs. Uh-oh, looks like they're getting ready to move. Sure wish I could go along over her gorgeous hips and ass and thighs. They really are something else. <laughs> sure wish I could go along walking all over this goddamn town. They really are something else. Would you look at those girls walking all over this goddamn town? acting as if they own it. All right. All right. Nice work. But after World War II, it changed. They had to go into a different line of business, so they had the store here. But this is where we would go see Santa Claus, down here in the basement. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. So I remember that. It's a different world then. Do you remember that? <laughs> Not, not that no, not particular, that. but it was a different world. Then. Yeah, it was a different world. Then. They had all different shops on the street here. They had Ann August, and you'd go, it was a, mostly a women's clothing, and but they had, we'd go, my mother sometimes, they had these tubes where the money would grow. Like the, the, right. And they had oh, yeah. one cashier in the office, yeah. and the girls would put the money in the thing, the tube, and come back down. So, cool stuff. Northampton was pretty cool in those days. Pretty cool. More, more so maybe than it is now, but now it's hip. Now it's like hip. So we're going to move out down the, down the stairs over to Pleasant Street, and we're going to go to Sylvester's, where Sylvester Graham's house is, and I'll read a poem by Sylvester Graham. How's that sound? Sylvester Graham House right here. Now Sylvester's restaurant. And 
my friend Bonnie Burnham makes the uh, baked goods there, so they're pretty good. But she's a pretty good baker. And uh, uh, was just kind of interesting Graham because he was an early advocate for health food. He, everyone, you know, ate white bread, and he said that people should have homemade, home stone ground bread. There were riots. Uh, bakers were attacked him. Um, he was also against drinking. <laughs> I think it was a vegetarian too. So he was not popular around town. He was like really odd. He used to walk in his house and bathe in the Mill River. The poet of bran and pumpkins. That's what Emerson called him. Yes. So uh, Sylvester Graham, famous Northampton Frank, and uh, we'll have Una's poem later. It's going to be read by your husband Bruce. And uh, I'm going to read a Sylvester Graham poem. This will give you an idea what kind of guy Sylvester Graham was. <clears throat> Addressed to a tooth on my 50th birthday. Farewell, old friend. Since thou and I must part, near half a century thou hast served me well. Our separation grieves me to the heart, and ah, the pang of parting, who can tell? Yet thou hast often caused me anguish fell and by thy aching almost driven me mad. But 12 years since, the dentist John Burdell cleansed thee and plugged thee, and it makes me sad that going thou takest with thee all the gold that I have. <laughs> and but, that, but for that infernal calomel the doctor gave me when I last was ill, though thy old crown is but a little shell, Though mightst have occupied thy station still, and long remained thy function to fulfill, but that foul drug, or mineral if you please, which serves less frequently to cure than kill, produced in the remedyless disease. Yes, calomel is the mercury they used to use. <coughs> so I have lost my tooth. The doctor's got his fees. Time was in life's more adolescent day. When all I should have thought of losing thee would have been the dread of having thee torn away from the socket of my jaw so ruthlessly. If would now then, as now, have seemed to me as if a part of mine own self was dead and never, never more in life could be replaced. As if thou solemnly hast led the way to that cold spot where I must lay my head. But I have reached the watershed of life, and now no more in youthful predilection look forward in this world for joy or strife, but rather in solemn retrospection muse on the past, intent on the detection of heaven's true meaning in each providence. Thus diving deep by truth-inspired reflection into the ways of God, draw wisdom thence, and learn his holy will from nature's page immense. This retrospective meditation brings stern admonitions from an eventful past and teaches that the beautiful forms of things we love in this bright world not long shall last. One and another in succession fast shall disappear forevermore and we are sweeping downward in the concourse fast. Such is the voice thy parting leaves to me. Farewell, old friend. Soon I shall follow thee. In fact, he was right. Sylvester Graham was dead within seven years. Sylvester Graham House is now Sylvester's Restaurant. Graham Crackers. That's the first one. He's your man. Graham Crackers. Nice and turtle ride. I bet he wouldn't like that with sugar. Yeah, I like mine with cinnamon sugar on it. <laughs> but, so we're going to walk around the block in front of Fitzwillie's. Oh, we got, um, Bruce is going to read. So uh, a brief introduction um, about, I don't know, the Cooley Dickinson Hospital, some of us do frequent that place once in a while. Um, so the namesake is, I don't know if everybody knows, Cal Cooley Dickinson was a local person who lived in Northampton or in Hatfield in the 1860s. 
and he made quite a fortune in investing in real estate, the raw railroad bonds. However, he was quite the quirky man, and uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, somebody asked me to do a uh, do some research on him, maybe write an article for the hospital. So, you know, I went to the old Daily Hampshire Gazettes, and to my surprise, there was, for months, there were articles about him and his family in a big argument. When he died, he left his fortune to, I forgot to say that, to, um, to start a hospital for the poor in Northampton. So, and he didn't, but his family was very upset about that since he gave all his money for this, uh, for this hospital and none for them. And so they contested the will in this major trial that was played out in the newspapers for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, and what the family contested was one, that he was insane, and he had spent some time in the Worcester State Hospital, walked there, and, oh, it wasn't, and two, that he had very quirky habits such as wearing women's clothing, which he did walk around town wearing a woman's hat. And he um, would have frequently hot baths in uh, Saratoga Springs and died there with women's clothing in his closet. So he was like the initial trans transvestite. Right? Cross-dressing. Trostress. And Trostress. Willie Dickinson didn't want to hear. Oh right, right. Well, when I, when, oh, I came, that story. when I came, when I came, when I came back to them, say here's the information. No, we don't want that. They call it. But um, it Bet, um, I don't know if, if you know people know Bet Powers, Bet Alwyn. What was her? Uh, what's her time? What does she have? A gay lesbian archive. Oh, she keeps the gay lesbian archives so, for so New a nonprofit, so I told her about this somehow. As I told, tell her, and she had a Smith student do a major research project on this. And there's going to be, she's going to have a, uh, a seminar at Smith sometime in the near future. So, so watch out. So, that's our, so here's the poem that my wife Una wrote about Sylvester Cram and Cal Cooley Dickinson. I'm not the best reader, but I'll give it a shot. This town's always been a resort for food cranks and sexual radicals. <laughs> Sylvester Graham advocated for home parent home baked bread over a century ago. Bakers tried to lynch him. Local boys, lovers of tea, jam, self abuse, and liquor through stones. Caleb Cooley Dickinson is our early transvestite hero, though that's not well known. He died in a Saratoga hotel room, fastened into women's corsets. Poor bastard, all his money went to fund the hospital. Angry relatives called him mad tried him posthumously, shaking out the skirts and hats. <laughs> Caleb insisted, and Sylvester, had you lived now, hand in hand, you might have run small dogs by Smith's dog, Smith's frog pond. You might have dropped quarters into tins for kids collecting soccer, traveling soccer funds, then shaken fresh persona at the farmer's market. Walk around, and I think maybe we'll walk up and read a couple by the train station, come back down, and we'll be done. Here. And also the book follows, besides this walking tour that we did, 
but I didn't read all the poems because I didn't think we had time. And we're going to read some tonight at, at Michelson's or this afternoon at Michelson's. But it also follows a bicycling tour that goes through Florence and Northampton on a 20 mile figure eight loop. And it mostly follows the bike trail, some country roads, and then back again, and then some country roads through the meadows where Peter's poem would be. And um, it's fun. I've done it many times. And it's a nice ride and it's safe and it can be handled. You could do it if you were not a big bike rider, you could do it in 10, two 10 mile sections. And um, for those of you who don't know the book, Pulled out. Here's the biking map. With all the little, with all the pages of the poems marked out, and then there's the, the walking tour that we just did with all the pages of the poems marked out. So it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. It was a lot of work. The maps were a lot of work. I drove myself crazy. <laughs> Trying to organize them. Um, Northampton has a famous son. He's not a native son. He's from um, he's from Vermont. But um, he was mayor here, and then he went on to be president of the United States. And I did a lot of research into him, looking for something I could I could put in the book by him. There's nothing. The guy was they called him Silent Cow. He didn't say much. He didn't say much. My great grandfather knew him. He served on the, my great grandfather served on the city council with Calvin Coolidge, and he said he had no use for him. He didn't like. Him. I don't know why. He was actually a very thoughtful speaker, yeah. and the, his, his the piece, the speech that he gave the flood in uh, Vermont in about 1923. It's a very it's short. Condensed, but it's very powerful yes. and it's very beautiful. His words are very precise. Yes. But I couldn't find anything poetic. Yes, go ahead. When he died, Dorothy Parker was informed that he died, and she said, How could they tell? <laughs> <laughs> but he had tra he I understand that the research I did is that he went downhill after his son died when they were in the White House, and he really lost interest in living, basically, especially in being president and, and things like that. So he did have a, a, a meteoric rise of a political career, and then they lost, I think was, the son was maybe 10 years old or something at the time. He had some kind of infection. Yeah, some kind of infection or they, blood poisoning or something. And he was playing tennis. He got a say he got a blister on his foot and got some kind of infection or something. So it was terrible, and uh, I guess that he really, that really uh, put him off his game. He really suffered after that. And it's understandable how anyone losing a child would feel that way. But his wife, Grace Coolidge, was a wonderfully graceful woman. That was that was her name, and of course she was a wonderfully graceful person. And um, she was also an amateur poet, and she wrote poetry, and she actually published some poetry. And this is one of her published poems. And it's called The Open Door, and this is regarding her son's, her son's uh, passing. The Open Door. You, my son, have shown me God. Your kiss upon my cheek has made me feel the gentle touch of him who leads us on. The memory of your smile when young reveals his face, and mellowing years come on apace and when you went before, you left the gates of heaven ajar that I might glimpse, approaching from afar, the glories of his grace. Hold, son, my hand. Guide me along the path that coming I may stumble not, nor roam, nor fail to show the way which leads us home. So, that's by Grace Coolidge. And they published that a few years after this and stuff. What other? That yellow building where um, Willie says that was his law office That's right. in there, the second floor. Right. And I think the door is still up there. So the door is at the Coolidge room at the second floor. Oh, that's floor. right. The door is yeah. at the Coolidge room now, yes. For years, the door was up there. Yes. So. so that is all I have to say about that. So he was our famous uh, 
figure from Northampton. Not many towns have a president that serves mm -hmm. for them. So it's pretty amazing. And uh, he was quite a figure in his day. So even if my great grandfather didn't have much good to say about it. <laughs> but, uh, he was famous because he broke the police strike. He was famous, famous for uh, when he was uh, governor breaking the police strike in Boston. Correct. Well, there's two sides to everything. Being a union man, that hurts me. Yeah. Let's continue. And we're going to come out of here. We're going to go behind there. We'll see Ernie's garage. We'll read Ernie's garage and we'll be done. We're actually, I'll read something. <laughs> corner, at the corner of um, King and Main Street, is the uh, where the suntan man used to stand. Right. If anyone remembers the suntan yeah. man. Yeah. Yes. The suntan man, that's my poem, is the suntan man. Right. But first I'll read the Ernie's Texaco, or Ernie's Garage is what used to be Texaco, now it's Sanofi. Okay. Ernie's Garage is on page 62. And this poem is by Michael Arage. Ernie's Garage. I grow old. Should write about it. Lost, tossed about, and thoughtless thoughts about God's whereabouts. Believing I know a little bit about the nature of it all. But my notions of connection with an ocean of soul don't hold water for long. Brain buckets sprung a hole. My godforsaken song of hearts gone out of tune. August hands off, it's leftover warmth to September. Time to hold my worried breath for car inspection. I drive to Ernie's Garage on King Street downtown, where they still pump your gas like when I was young. Ageless Ernie covers the counter. Cranky sometimes, but smiling. Like underneath his stress, his taste of wine. He's robust, relaxed, half kidding, but matter of fact. He'll drop work, hear your complaints, voice his own back, and tell you what that front end making noise means. Don't worry for now. If it were me, I'd just let it be. I settle into that three seat lobby to wait with someone, afraid a stumbling old road stallion might bite the dust. I'm told my old Buick won't pass without a new gasket. So I take time to begin an ode to the approach of old age, full of passionate drama I don't feel but I begin this way. I've got my back to the wall of life's little camping tent with the stakes giving out, poles collapsing in the wind and bristling combs of lightning cloud over my mind. Their shock thought threats, their sharp electric frowns arouse suspicions that I'm a long way from young. A husky mechanic shows me my gasket. It's shot. <laughs> Theirs won't fit and the auto parts driver's out sick. Not a cell phone owner, I have to give my wife a call from the vintage phone booth in the lobby of the hotel. Maybe it's the last active payphone left downtown. I cross over to Jake's for a mug of muddy caffeine, gaze at the grease stained print of a saxophone king and continue my poem, jotting down zinger one-liner, age rage bumper stickers that careen through my mind. You grow old, complain, the joints no longer jumping. 
you feel a little left behind and prefer to stay there. Your rock guitar fantasies are like old broken strings. Your swollen night crawler veins leak like a broken gasket. You wonder if your body, your soul will pass inspection. You hear the dark, dark angels of death chewing at your chains. You fill an empty coffin with all of your things, sparkling junk buried under your tombstone name, trying to fool God. I close my notebook before it becomes too much. Go back and find my blue Buick with the gasket all fixed up. And hey, they only want a hundred bucks. Less than I expected. You've got to love Ernie's garage. Feel good. You're good to go another 12 months. Yeah. Yeah. The last poem I'll read for you before we head over to uh, the Michelson um, is The Suntan Man. And this is my poem about the suntan man. We used to stand on the corner here. Could be 10 below zero. He didn't care. If the sun was shining, he was getting some sun. Okay. Yeah, let's go. sun was shining, even if it was 10 below, he would be there, on the corner, under the clock. He never wore a shirt. His bare skin and bronzed head, his bare skin and shaved head gleamed like a bronze Indian. He stood timeless, alone, in the center of town. For years I saw him there, in that same exact spot in that same precise pose, leaning against the block, soaking up the sun, until one day he was gone. Sun Why'd you read it then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Red light, green light, 61. In Northampton, Massachusetts, where Route 5 crosses Group nine, red lights turning green are celebrated with an accompaniment of mechanical bird tweets. When the birdies sing, it is allowed, encouraged even, to crisscross the street. Punks, suits, soccer moms, people pushing strollers or pamphlets, leathermen, lesbians, musicians all meet in the tweet tweet intersection of the street. Panhandlers, townies, and tourists gaze and are gazed upon. The pressed few look at their feet. A fat girl pedals a red bike. She waits for the green light, then rides to Pulaski Park, where a blue globe thistle shivers, thrilled by the hump suck of a red bottom bee. Yay. Uh. <laughs> 